Is your child getting or should they be getting special education or support services at school? If so, you probably have some questions or maybe even some frustrations about these services. Since March, everything has been turned upside down. And while everyone is doing the best they can, distance learning isn't working for some students and others seem to have regressed. Today, special needs attorney Rich Isaacs is here to talk about ways to work with your school to get your child's needs met. This is LD Expert Live. Welcome to LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning differences, dyslexia, and attention challenges. I'm your host, Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers and author of At Wit's End, A Parent's Guide to Ending the Struggle, Tears, and Turmoil of Learning Disabilities. To get a free copy, go to parentsatwitsend.com. Hey, Happy New Year, everyone. I hope you loved our best of 2020 show last week. We already have a great lineup for you for 2021. Let's say hello to Lauren Ma, our Director of Clinical Growth and Operations for Stowell Learning Centers and our moderator for today. Hello. Good morning, Lauren. Good morning. Hi, everyone. Let us know who's here. Uh, post in the in the comments and let us know that you're here and where you're checking in from. We'd love to see everyone who joins us each week and where you're checking in from from all over the country. It's so exciting. So let us know that you're here. And if you have questions for today's guests, please post them in the chat below. Um, parents, we have a community for parents like you. Our mom squad is a private Facebook group. You can find it by either going to our Facebook page or searching for Facebook groups, under Facebook groups, SLC Mom Squad, uh, and you'll find it. It's a private Facebook group. You do need to request to join. It is a community of parents like you, parents of uh, kids or teens with learning or attention challenges, and we support each other there. We have resources. I'm putting together a couple of units of resources if your child has uh, reading difficulties, some, some strategies for helping them with reading, some strategies for helping them with spelling. Uh, you can post comments, you can post anonymously if you just want to just want to get some advice from the group. It's a it's a really uh, supportive community. So we welcome you to join. And in Mom Squad next week, we will be broadcasting our peace group, our first peace meeting virtually of the new year, Thursday, January 21st at 5pm Pacific time, I'll be hosting that that is a support group for parents like you. So it is going to be broadcast only through Mom Squad, not on our regular Facebook page. Um, but in order to participate, we do encourage you to participate, to join the conversation, to talk, to share, to ask questions in real time. You do need to register to get the Zoom link. So, and you can do that by going to stolecenter.com slash peace. So be sure to register for that. I'm really looking forward to meeting all of you virtually and that should be a lot of fun our peace meetings have always been really popular when we hosted them live in each of our centers and now we can meet virtually so i can i can meet you parents from all over the world it's gonna be great uh, we already have people checking in so let's see who's who's here with us this morning karen from sacramento hello welcome nicole from texas hi welcome we have ronke from ann arbor michigan Hi, welcome. We have Annie from Pasadena. Hello, Annie. Welcome. Ooh, look at this. We have uh, Matt checking in from Lebanon, Indiana, and Flora checking in from Montclair, California. And we have, um, it says, Happy New Year. It says, Hello, Denise Hernandez. I don't know if we're logged in under somebody else's name, but hello and welcome. So this is exciting. We have people already checking in. I know today's topic is something that in our learning centers, um, there's been a lot of talk. A lot of parents have been asking questions um, about 
their rights uh, for their child. Uh, Rich and his law group has worked with a number of our students in our learning centers. So really excited about today's show and what he has to share because a lot of parents are trying to figure out what to do and how to advocate for their child during this pandemic. So really excited about today's show. Great. Well, we'll be checking back in with, uh, with you, Lauren, and with the audience for questions in a bit. If you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm your host, Jill Stowell. Our guest today is attorney and advocate Rich Isaacs. Rich is the founder of the California Special Needs Law Group. He is committed to helping children have equal access to an education and ensuring families receive fair, effective representation at mediations, hearings, and appeals. He believes that all resolutions must focus on what's best for the child and their long-term future. And as Lauren mentioned, a number of our families from our various centers have worked with Rich and his team. So welcome, Rich. Happy Good morning. New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you for having me. Well, it's great to have you. You know, as students are getting back to school and we're heading into the second semester, I think a lot of parents are starting to feel a little panicked about this school year. What do parents need to know right now during the pandemic about their child's special education services and rights? Yeah, there's a lot going on right now. Um, you know, take the pandemic out of this. And once we hit January and we start going into the new year, it's a busy time anyways. You know, we have at this point uh, in the school year, we know if students are struggling, we know what's working, we're getting assessments or the district is assessing in the fall. And then we're looking at alternative assessments. We're, we're starting to look at summer and we're starting to look at what do students need uh, in terms of remediation, and we really start focusing on what do we need for the summer to build them or set them up for the next school year. Now you put the pandemic into it, and I know there's people from other states around. In, in California, we've been pretty uh, pretty focused on closing the schools down, un unfortunately, from my pr perspective. Um, I think it's done a lot of uh, unnecessary damage in, in a way without you know focusing too much on, on the – the damage piece, but it really is. It's educational harm that's been done to our children. So now that we start having opening dates and we have some families who want their student in virtual learning, we have some parents who want their child to go back in the schools, you know, are open in, in some fashion, depending on what district you have. Um, but the question's the same. It's the same question that we would have without the pandemic. What is working and what is not? And then what do we need to identify to understand that you know or answer that question of what's working and if it's not working how do we fix it going forward and how do we remedy it so we can close any deficits that's been created for um you know during the, the pan pandemic mm -hmm. so uh, that really is is the question how do we remedy that i mean if parents feel like just in a typical year if they feel like what's happening isn't working or especially right now, if parents feel like their children either missed out on services or they just weren't able to benefit from them because of the restrictions, what options do they have? Yeah, and it's gonna be different for everybody. The, the first step is really to work with your team. So assuming that you're, you're qualified, that you have an IEP, and for those families who haven't qualified, but maybe they noticed during this time that their child's really struggling, you can always request the district uh, initiate the special education assessments. But moving to those students who have the IEP, how you identify it, you always wanna bring your concerns to the educators, which is the IEP team. And if you if you read the, the law and no matter where you're at in, in the country, the IDEA, the Individuals with Disability Education Act applies um, not to get into the, the, the weeds of it, but it's, it's a federal law that all the states have adopted to get the funding for special ed in there. It really does lay out the importance of the IEP team and you want to bring your concerns to the IEP team. That, that's step one and share and document, you know, have evidence. If, if you can get samples, if you can show lack of progress on goals, if you can show that the virtual you know, accessing the related services virtually is just not working. If your child's, you know, ha has autism at a level that they're just not able to access anything online, 
well, how do we come up with the remedies? We asked the, the district to look at that. The, the simple approach, not always the best, but one way would just be an hour for hour. So in some of our cases where we know that, let's say they're getting uh, some speech services or some individual SAI services, uh, re some kind of academic remediation virtually, but it's not working, we'll just go back to last March when the school shut down and say, well, we want an hour for hour makeup going forward. And if we can get a lump sum of hours, maybe we can quantify that with a number. And we can say either we can go use a non-public agency to provide it, you know, that support that was missed. The other side is to look at assessments. And when I say assessments, really look at the students' present levels today and compare it to where they were a year ago. And has there been a lack of progress? Has there been any regression? And then actually come up with a recommendation of compensatory education, of how do we make up for that lost time or that re that regression that, that's occurred. And then we look at specific programs like the Stoll Center, um, an agency that can come in and provide a service to address you know, the, what, what's been created because of all this pan pandemic, school closures, virtual learning. Mm -hmm. You know, you mentioned that term, compensatory education. What, because that's being thrown around a lot now, what exactly is that? Yeah, so in, in, in terms of the IDEA, we don't have the typical damages that you would find in other areas, which is a, a, a good thing um, in a sense where we're not gonna complicate uh, a lawsuit with this school district. But what we have is we have educational damages and we call it compensatory education. So the compensatory piece is what do we need to put the child in the position they should have been in had they actually received an appropriate education? Um, and that's where we come up. It, it's a it's actually a hard analysis um, because you have to have somebody weigh in. And this is where our experts come in. And when I say experts, this is where the assessments come in. And they have to they have to evaluate the, the child and they have to say, you know, you know, had X, Y and Z not happened, the child would be performing here. And then they got to make a recommendation, which is the compensatory ed rec of what services they need to put them back in the position they, they, they should have been. And a lot of times what we're talking about would be academic remediation or some kind of therapy uh, to address it. It's simple if say you, you miss 50 sessions of speech and language. Well, you could just say, well, we want 50 more sessions, but is that actually what the child needs? And the compensatory education would come in and look at that. Because if you miss 50 sessions over nine months, maybe you need a hundred sessions to make up for that missed 50. Maybe you need more individual services or a different approach and same with academics. So the, we can do the hour for hour analysis, but sometimes you want to go deeper and just, just to add to the compensatory, sometimes you don't actually need it. And sometimes you'll, you'll, a student will not have services, but when you really look at, did, was there any regression? Um, what do we need to make up for that lost time? Sometimes, and for some students, there's either a, a little compensatory ed or none that would actually be required. And that's where the district, I think, is gonna push back on families um, and say, well, we know we missed this time, but we don't think they need that much remediation. Or we don't need, think they need that much, comp you know, ser that many services in comp ed. Hmm. You know, I, I think that's a really great way to look at it as opposed to the hour for hour. Um, is, is really looking, because it's really all about what does the child need to, to get where they need to be? And um, so I, I think that's a good way to look at it. And, you know, there have actually been some kids in special education who have done better because there is less distraction, you know, and, and somehow this virtual uh, learning has worked better for them. Um, of course, many it hasn't, and so you know there's got to be there's got to be a way to to help those kids. Um, I think you know always the question comes up about money, about funds. I mean, I, I assume that there are challenges with schools with with all of what they've had to do with COVID, and you know, are there funds for this kind of thing? Yeah, that's a yeah, uh, there are funds. And I just going back to you just really quick, I, I think you're right. I think just as the the 
general education setup works for the majority of our students. For some, it doesn't. And I think the same with the virtual learning. I, I think we're going to learn a lot and there's some really good things just trying to find the silver lining that are going to come out of this. And we have a lot of families whose students struggle with anxiety um, who are actually making more progress uh, in the virtual or hybrid programs that are being offered. Uh, which is a really good thing, and I'm hoping we can build on that for them. Uh, but for a lot of students, they're obviously not, and and they have either that you know in California, they've shortened the school day the, this year, mm -hmm. so now they're instead of you know whatever it was six and a half hours a day or whatever, now it's um, like 240 minutes. You know we're down to about four hours a day, and then if you add in the related services during that time, we've even, we've even shrunk what some of these students are accessing. I think that's gonna be problematic. So is there money to pay for the remediation? Absolutely. Um, in California, and, and if you're in other states, you know, there's probably literature about this. Um, if, if you do a Google search about some of the, the state legislation that, that's coming out, you can find some answers. But in California, we have Senate Bill 98 that, that was uh, put into effect this summer, which gave, I believe, about $100 million to the schools. And, you know, I talked to a lot of school councils, attorneys for school districts, and of course, like, oh, that's not enough money. It's gone. And, you know, we had to use it for this. There is a ton of money. Um, a lot of it was spent for, you know, uh, PPE stuff for the schools to open. A lot of it's spent on technology getting, and the benefit is we're getting uh, tech for all the kids now. So some of our younger kids didn't have that, that computer access or that Chromebook or iPad, but now they do. And granted that's where some of the money goes, but there is a lot of money for remediation and that's what the funding was for. And in California, we're gonna come out, I think they're gonna put about another 2 billion uh, this school year into the schools to fully re reopen. Um, I haven't read the specifics of that piece, but it's a benefit and we we need to be be ready and as parents and with the families we work with, we need to be ready. And when I say that, we need to know what are we requesting for that mm -hmm. child to make up for the, for the time that was lost. And if we have that answer, the districts will, they should, and they're willing to jump on board for the most part to, to address the, those needs. So, so that's a really um, good thing to hear that, that the districts are willing, you know, that, that they're trying to work together because I feel like often parents don't feel like the schools want to help. I mean, we, we do hear that. Yeah. You know, and I think there's a natural tendency. It's easy to say no, right? You go to an IEP meeting and everybody has the authority to say no. But sometimes you, it's hard to find that yes person. And you find that yes person in, um, by bringing the right data and information to the, to the team. And what we found, and this is specific to the, to the uh, pandemic phase and IEP meetings and all the stuff that's happening, is the districts know, they'll say it at IEP meetings that it's not working. If you have a student with a one-to-one -one aid, there's no way that they're going to learn virtually without that one-to-one -one aid. And they'll admit it, yeah, it's not working. But if you can bring the solution to them and either that's funding a, a, a private program, it's pulling the student from the school and putting them separately, it's homeschooling and bringing support in. But if you can find a reasonable solution, when I say reasonable, you know, within the general cost criteria that the district would, would spend anyways, um, or these general cost criteria of these non-public agencies, non-public schools, the district, the way I look at it is they get to say, oh, great, you found the solution, we couldn't we'll pay for that now that we can cross you off our list you know mm -hmm. now this child's taken care of and then they'll move to because they have every student with an iep is going to have different needs and there's going to be different solutions to address those needs but if you bring that solution to the team now if you just go to the team and say it's not working i want you to fix it they're gonna no we're just gonna keep doing what what we're doing you have to have concrete examples or concrete um ideas of what you want them to do for you and that starts the conversation. That That is great advice because I think a lot of times people don't really think that. They think, well, if I go to the school, they will know what to do. And, and they certainly know a lot about their own parameters. But as you said, every single student is different. Their needs are different. And so anything that we can bring to the table you know, it may not be that they don't want to help, but that they just don't really know what solution to offer. Yeah, they have four, you know, if they have a tool belt, 
they have four tools in there. And now it's going to be put the child in this box, this box, this box, or this box. And when that doesn't work, they really can't go outside that. They're not going to bring it to you. And then, for example, they're not going to say, well, let's just send, you know, this student to the Stoll Learning Center. They're not. They're not going to throw that idea out. But you can go to the Stoll Learning Center or these other agencies and you can get assessments and you can show present levels and you can show a specific program that's going to be that's going to address their needs with a specific you know, with it, with the cost, an actual cost. And then you can say, okay, well, you don't have anything that's working. We, we do, we went out and found it. Can we get you on board with it? And uh, that's the first step. And then if sometimes they'll, they'll say yes right away. Other times, you know, there's that legal process that that's needed to get them to yes. But um, they are much more willing to listen if you bring a solution to them now. Great. You know, I've talked to many parents who feel intimidated by the schools. So the idea that they would come and they would say, here's, here's the solution that I really want you to look at is, you know, can be intimidating. When parents go to an IEP meeting, you know, they kind of feel like, oh, I'm walking into the school's territory and we're not on equal footing. How do you encourage parents to prepare for that meeting and for good communication. I mean, ultimately it's a team, you know, that's working for the child. It's not us and them. So how do you encourage parents to prepare for that communication? Yeah, it's, you know, and I know it's different for every parent and the teams are different for everybody. Um, and then there's emotions, you know, the, the nice thing about an advocate or an attorney is we get to pull the emotions out because we represent the family and we're always solution focused. So we're always going to look at the end result. We got to figure out what do we want and how do we get there? And as a parent, you're going to bring a lot more to it because you're with the child every day. You're seeing the struggles and you're seeing, let's say the tears and you might be crying along with your child, which is the frustration. So I think it's a little bit harder at IEP meetings to be, um, so open-minded or so for forgiving uh, we coach a lot of our families you know it's the families will be working with the school district for years and there might be a dispute and we try really hard to make it not personal and you know we push really hard against school districts and we're very clear it's not personal against you we're just focused on what the students need um, mm -hmm. But the best way to an IEP meeting is hard as it sounds sometimes. And I say this when I speak to parent groups and I get like, but we can't is be friendly. You know, it's, it's, it's the values that, that we have, it's be friendly, be solution focused. And if, if there's ever a, a, a problem, you get around it by focusing back on the student. So parents are mm -hmm. uh, uh, a key member of the IEP team. They have to participate. The whole IEP team is set up so the parents can hear about their child's needs. They can be part of the conversation to put a program together that's going to address their child's needs. And then the parents have to consent to it. I, I believe strongly in advocates. And I believe strongly that advocates have a really important role to play. Um, you know, I mean, we, we handle things when they go legal or we file suits against school districts, but advocates can do a lot. And, and part of what an advocate can bring to the table is they can, they can address the parents' concerns, ask the right questions, just because they have the experience doing it. Where sometimes when parents are in an IEP meeting, Jill, like, like you said, it's all these faces just looking at them and they feel alone and an advocate can really help bridge that. And if you don't want to get an advocate, just bring a family friend. Uh, a spouse is good, but sometimes bringing somebody outside that, that, uh, your family, the whole team will act different. It's, you know, they may say little comments, they may roll their eyes, but you bring somebody else to the team and, and their attitude shifts a little bit. So that's another way to just, to just help. Um, but I just encourage all of our families work, work well with the team. If you have a disagreement, there is a way, there is a solution to get around it. But, but, uh, don't, you know, don't get, let your frustration get out on, on the team because you're not, that's not going to benefit you in the long run. And so thinking uh, solution oriented data, you know, really sharing specifically, here are the needs and here is why. I find that, you know, if I'm asking for something and I explain why, uh, you know, then then people are going to listen a little bit better too. Well, and have the the data. And, you know, we've learned a lot with the virtual learning. 
And we've, we've learned a lot because parents are now much more involved and they're either helping their child access their, their learning. So they understand uh, a little bit more about, you know, the executive functioning deficits that their child might, might have, you know, the organization, the self starting, the planning, all these, these deficits that, you know, is handled at the school, but they didn't really get to see. But the biggest thing is you look at the district's data or your child's work per performance and ask your, your questions and say, you know, well, what is the grade level here? What is the standard? What are we trying to do here? And then don't let them just say, oh, yeah, yeah, but they're fine. Or, yeah, you know, it's low average, but it's good. But really look at and address and ask questions, ask very specific questions to the team. You know, where we're, if we're supposed to do a year's growth in a year, are we? And if not, then what do we need to add to the program to, to get there? And you'll find that if, if the questions aren't asked in an accusatory way and the discussion is, well, let's just figure this out as a team, everybody will brainstorm and, and, and jump in. And you may still have the naysayers. You may still have different difficult administrators. And, you know, there's nothing we can totally do about that other than just keep pushing through. But if it, by being positive and solution focused and identifying your questions with data, like, OK, well, let's look at this. Let's talk about this. Uh, I think you're going to see a lot more progress with the IEP teams. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, parents, you know, actually going out and, and finding the solution, maybe getting an assessment, bringing it to the team. Does the school take into account outside assessments or information? like that that they've brought in they they do so the the nice thing about the law is they have to consider it and when i say consider that's actually the term that the law you, uses is when you bring in outside information they have to consider that information and determine do they need to adjust the child's iep based on that uh they don't have to adopt it they don't have to you know take it word for for word but what you can show, and this is why it's so important to find those outside solutions, the district is only responsible for what they know. And they can't, you know, you can't learn about something, uh, say, in 2020, and then go back to, and say, well, you should have done this in 2018. But they didn't know about it. And that's why it's really important that, that you, you, you articulate at IEP meetings, but you also follow up in writing any concerns you have because they need to know about it. And then if you have you know, solutions, if you get assessments, you need to share it, let the IEP team talk about it, and then you need to specifically request that those recommendations are adopted. And they may say no, but then as a lawyer, at least, we can go, go into the file and we can say, you know, six months ago, the parent brought this information to you and you didn't do anything. Now look where the child's at. Now that, you know, we have regression and you could have addressed it back then and you didn't actually consider because if you would have considered, you would have, you would have improved the IEP or added additional services or, or programming. So um, district assessments, on the other hand, for the most part, and there, I mean, there's some nuances here, but they would have to implement their own recommendations. Mm -hmm. Well, that's, that's great information to have. Thank you. If you're just joining us, this is LD Expert Live. I'm Jill Stowell, founder of Stowell Learning Centers. We've been talking with special needs attorney, Rich Isaacs, about current questions and challenges around special education. Let's check in with Lauren and our viewers. Hello. I want to make sure I get to everyone. So we have um, Aslam saying hi. And we have Tanya checking in from Denver, Colorado. She says she has two high schoolers. They only had eight in-person days last semester. They're still shut down there in Colorado. And kids are supposed to go back to school February 1st, similar to it's kind of what's happening in California, uh, but only two days a week. So that's kind of what's happening in Colorado and some other states. Uh, Ronke is weighing in on your um, suggestions, your advice to have an advocate. And she said that she wants, she's a grad student and she wants her professor once attended with her to an IEP meeting and, and helped to advocate for her daughter. That's great. Um, we do have, there's a, a question, a situation that is rather long, so I'm going to try my best. Um, Ellie is saying, my child's triennial assessment was conducted last year. This year, during his recent and to be continued annual IEP, his team proposed new goals. And we're hearing about this also a lot. The team is brand new. So everyone on the team left the school. 
uh, last year, and the goals don't really seem to relate to prior goals. They say the goals were determined based on their work with my child so far this year. Is that sufficient or should she request that more formal assessments be done? Yeah, that's, um, and again, you know, I, I practice in California. So with the IDEA, there's a lot of flexibilities for the states to take different approaches with diff different approaches with statute limitations, different approaches of what, if they can set a different standard. So you would definitely always have to re re refer um, when I, uh, to your own state laws. Um, but generally speaking, if the district did a triennial assessment a year ago, um, here we have a two year statute of limitations uh, in special ed matters. And that means that we can, we have two years to request that the district privately fund or publicly fund, I mean, uh, additional assessments, which are the IEEs. Um, the district has two choices when you request that. They can either uh, defend their assessments via due process hearing or they can agree to fund. Um, in this case, though, my concern would be if you had a triennial IEP, so you had a year ago all the assessments which developed the goals, and then a year later, they've kind of just thrown those goals out and they say, hey, well, let's work with these goals. So the first question is, were those goals met? And what, what data do they have to show that those goals were met? Because they can easily say yes or, oh, you know, you, you want to see it. And then if they weren't met, are we carrying them over or have we adjusted the goals? Um, and then you got to look at the the new goals and what are, what areas are the new goals in? Were they are they in new areas that weren't identified a year ago? And mm -hmm. so a good way to do this is to just do a goal comparison chart. And when I would do an, a longer one. So I would go back to say uh, the last assessment, not the triennial a year ago, but the one prior. And I would just start comparing the goals over the, the years and see, have they grown? Are they met? Are they carrying over some of the goals? Because that's one of the questions that you're going to look at to be answered if you're going to determine if their program's appropriate. So it's a new team. They have, you know, maybe new ideas and they're based like, hey, here's the goals. And, and it, it might absolutely be appropriate. But the big concern is, well, you had all this information a year ago and you might be able to use, just thinking out loud here, the new goals as well, you had all this information a year ago, what's changed? Why didn't you identify these? And I, I just said, you know, you can't go back in hindsight, but you can as much as you, you, you can push on them. Why didn't you identify this with your last assessments? And if these are new goal areas, that, that is a good uh, way to request that they publicly fund additional assessments. I'd, I'd want additional assessments um, to know, uh, to look at the district's assessments for a year ago, were they true present levels, were the assessments accurate, and then really confirm, if anything, that, that the program's appropriate or to use those new assessments to make it better. Okay. And Ellie does say she is in California, so um, you know what you know of California law would apply to her. So it was great advice. So um, so we have a few other a few other questions. Um, hope I'm pronouncing this right, Bibinaz says, hi, Jill, great to see you. How do we secure a 504 for a student who doesn't have a learning disability, but has psychological or an emotional diagnosis, a severe anxiety, depression, suicide attempts, school refused testing, and set up an SSSP meeting? Um, so any ad advice or recommendations there? Yeah, and I guess my also in Cal yeah. She is also oh. in California, I believe. Oh, OK. Uh, when it comes to, to the 504, we really push hard to get a student qualified under an IEP. There's so many more protections under an IEP. Um, the 504 law is very basic. Section 504 of the 1973 Rehab Act, uh, you know, came out in the 70s and they really haven't, the IDEA came out uh, uh, much later and it's so much more specific. So when we look at section 504 and the 504 plan, we refer a lot to what the IDEA re requires for the IEP. There's no timeline. There's no requirement of, uh, you know, what has to be listed in a 504 plan, but based on the, on the concerns that you have, I would request that the district do a full assessment for special education, a full psychoeducation assessment, look at the social emotional, do, you know, look at the anxiety, look at the depression. How is that impacting their ability to access their education? If they're, you know, don't want to do testing, there's refusal. You got to really figure out what is going on and then how do we address that? 
Uh, my assumption is that they would qualify for an IEP. Now, if they don't, and you have an IEP meeting, an eligibility meeting, and they say, you know what, we're not going to qualify, but we'll put them on a 504 plan. Then you use all those special ed assessments to develop that 504 plan. You know, and that would be giving accommodations and stuff like that. But based on the concerns that you have, I, I think a really good special education assessment is necessary and really fish out what is what is going on and what's causing some of those things that, that you're seeing. And then I'd push for an IEP. Um, she she is giving us additional information. She says, yes, she's in California. Uh, her child has already had private testing and has a diagnosis. However, uh, the school district is denying an IEP because of grades and also refusing a 504. So I, um, which we, we see sometimes with our students as well, they may have, they may work so hard to get those grades. So the school doesn't actually see a struggle uh, mm -hmm. despite testing and diagnosis. Um, so what can be done and what can a parent do in that situation? Yeah, you know, you know, that's really heartbreaking too. And when it comes to IEP eligibility, it's a two prong test. So you first have to have a qualifying eligibility and then by reason of that disability, you have to require special education related services. So my assumption here would be that, okay, so there's a qualifying eligibility, but because of the good grades, uh, the student doesn't require special education. Now that's just ridiculous. And you know we push really hard on eligibility uh, issues like this because the IEP is more than just grades. Grades alone, uh, the district is responsible to educate the full child. It's not just grades, it's social, emotional. The, if you look at the first stated purpose of the IDEA, it's so we can create uh, uh, really just happy adults that are employable. And that's what we need. You need to be employable. Well, if you carry all this social emotional, if you carry this anxiety, if you can't even take a, a test because, you know, if it's anxiety uh, caused or, or whatever, that's problematic. And as, as you said, it, a lot of times it'll dismiss all the hard work that the student's doing. So let's say that a, a, a typical student's gonna work about an hour at night, but this student's gonna be working four or five hours a night. They're gonna be working on the weekends just to maintain those grades. The different approach would be, oh my gosh, let's not lose that momentum of what they're working on. Now let's give them the support to an IEP to start addressing that so they don't have to con continue to work that hard because eventually they're, they're, they're not going to do it. And it might be that they won't go to college or they'll go to college and drop out or that eventually at some point in high school, they're just going to give up because it's too hard. They absolutely should have an IEP based, based on, on what, what you said. And you absolutely can, can get one. Um, it might be working with an advocate or bringing an attorney in, but if you, if what you said and you have the diagnosis and, and what you, it's, it's way more, um, than academics. And there's just, you know, it's like with a high school diploma, we have students who can't read or they read, you know, at a second grade level, but they'll give them a high school diploma and, um, a high school diploma is meaningless because it's so subjective. Anybody can just pass through classes. Uh, but do they really know what they're doing? Can they can they continue on with their their learning? And that's what we're looking at here. So grades are a small snippet, but we got to look at the bigger picture. And um, that's where outside assessments, specific assessments or specific programs. Again, just going back to the Stowell Learning Center, uh, you, you take your child and you'll get a, a, a different idea of where your child's performing. And that's that solution I'm talking about. So they're saying, no, we'll go find a program that's going to say, OK, well, your student's here. And through this program, we're gonna get them here. And then the district can actually see that. And then they have a choice. Are they gonna fight you? Or will they agree to help help you fund or reimburse or whatever that kind of remediation program? But but definitely don't be silenced because they just say no. There is a, a, a way around this. And I'm sorry that, that you're going through this. Yeah, and, and she says, thank you. Good to know you can get an IEP without a learning disability. Uh, great advice. And we have Tanya also weighing in on kind of the same conundrum that we do hear about all the time that, you know, the child gets good grades, they're gifted and talented, doesn't qualify for an IEP. Um, and she elaborates a little bit more. It doesn't matter now he's a senior, he's graduated with, his, he's going to graduate with his diploma or he did in December. Uh, he graduated a semester early, but he lost an entire senior year due to COVID. Uh, but at least COVID did not cause him to lose. He still graduated his high school diploma. I'm concerned about other high schoolers with learning challenges. I mean, you know, some of our kids, they, they can 
you know, muster through it and they have incredible grit. I mean, it takes a lot of tears and effort and, you know, that they get through it, but others don't. And, and, you know, without the supports in place, especially if the school is only looking at the surface level uh, symptoms with grades, if those tend to be fine, they don't see the pain. That's mm -hmm. kind of lower um, that the parent would see at home. So thank you. We do have a number of questions. I, I you know, I know this is a popular topic, so I want to make sure I get to everyone. Uh, Matt is asking, what is your advice for when the school wants to keep revising the IEP minutes of service uh, to only what the school thinks it is able to provide versus what the school, what the student actually needs? So they're mm -hmm. trying to revise the service minutes. Yeah, and that's, um, I don't know if that question is because of, of the shortened day and they're trying to revise the minutes. So let's say we cut the school day down by 70 or, or 25% or whatever. And then we want to reduce by 25% the related services. Um, that's going to be an interesting question. If, if that's actually the, the question that, that gets answered. Uh, my, my view of it would be that, no, we know what the student needs because we have an IEP from last year that has the related services and those related services are developed based on the goal so they can make progress and meet those those goals so the team knew that so to take it a year ahead and say we're going to revise the services i think is going to be problematic um it doesn't mean the district's not going to do it and this kind of goes into the next step like we talked about well what's the solution um that is something where parents can then you know pay for private uh intervention and seek reimbursement you would obviously want to give the, the district notice um, and if you don't want to do that, at least put in writing to the district your concerns here that, you know, if we have this, if the goals remain the same, then the services should remain the same. And there's, there be, I think it's going to be very problematic for the district to, to reduce services. When I say problematic, if this was ever pushed forward, if we ever brought in the, the legal side of it, would they actually have a justifiable reason to do it or a defensible reason to, to do that? And I'm, I'm not sure. And I don't think that, that, that they would. Right. And Matt is saying, yes, it is due to COVID restrictions. They reduced the, the amount of um, service um, time. You know, so. you know, this is a time when we have to think out of the box a little bit. So with that shortened school day, you know, maybe they can't get all of the services in during the school day, but could could you know, is it okay for schools to do services after school or more intensively during the summer? Or, you know, are there other solutions like that that they could be looking at, Rich? Yeah, absolutely. Again, this is being solution focused, right? And bringing it to, to the team. So, if and I would encourage you, those in California to read Senate Bill 998. Just Google it, you can read it. Uh, focus in on the special education piece. There's a lot of money and uh, to deal with regression. This is for all students, not not just special. Ed. This is all students who lost uh, traction. But it does specify in there that you can provide services out of the school day. Mm -hmm. So generally speaking, the, the district's not going to do do that. Um, they're not going to provide services on the weekend. They're not going to you know provide services after school in an IEP. But here, because they've shortened the school day. The new law that that's in place, Senate Bill 98 for the 2021 school year allows them to do that. So if you're going to be going to school a couple hours a day in the morning, then you should be getting additional services in the afternoon. And again, it's bringing these solutions. So a lot of the families that we work with um, will have them go in person for related services, though they may be virtual learning. Those students who can't access virtual learning, we've been able to create cohorts, even individual cohorts, which it's just the student's aid and the student in person, and then we'll push the related services in. But we want to keep the same related service hours that, that we've agreed upon in the past. Now, um, going just really quick back to the two-year statute limitation. This is uh, Jill, you and I were talking about be, before, don't feel overwhelmed or rushed and definitely don't feel pressure that you have to fix everything right now. There's a two year statute of limitations. Document the request in writing, document and, and specify why are you cutting the services? This is what was agreed upon. You never agreed to cut the related services down and you know make the request for them to continue it make the request for them to do it outside of, of the, you know, the modified school day. And then it's okay to sit on it if you have. And then when you go back and, and get an assessment or you look at, 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 you know, kind of resolving all these issues, you could do it next next fall even. The two year, you know, the 
session limitations for the shutdown is not going to run until March of um, 2022. So we have time to figure it out. I hope that that helps some of you. That, you know, that's, that's really great to know. Now that is specific to California, right? That two-year statute of limitations? Yeah, some states have a one-year. I know with the CDE here, if we file compliance complaints, we have a one-year. And, I, and I, I know that some states have a, have a one-year statute of limitations, which is way too fast. It's, really, it's, it's unfortunate. But in California, we, we do have a two-year. Great. We have Lan just weighing in, saying her gate child also, school told her, does not qualify for an IEP. Um, we, we are hearing a lot of that. We, we, we have heard a lot of that for years. Hey, um, Laura. Yeah. Sorry, just because we're seeing the, the, the twice. If you guys research, uh, you know, for these families that have the gifted children, the twice exceptional, there's some really good assessments that, that can be done. Uh, Jill, you guys are probably looking at that, that, that too, in terms of your assessment. So you can show the areas that they're gifted in, but maybe they have really significant executive functioning deficits or attention deficits. And you need to get that additional information just because they're gifted and smart. And, you know, just by way of example, this districts will say average. So, you know, let's say you have a 125, 130 IQ. And then on some of the academic areas, you're still performing it. You know, I'm just using standardized scores. Uh, mm -hmm. But let's say you have an 85 and they're like, oh, well, you're just low average. You don't need intervention. But you're really looking at that gap. You're looking yeah. at, well, well, for this student, you do need intervention. And there is guidance from the Office of Civil Rights, OCR, on, on this issue. Uh, we've actually litigated this issue. And there's some really good 2E experts. But what you want to look at is focus on the deficits and even though the strength and the intelligence is carrying your child through, we still want to close those deficit areas, those executive functioning deficits, those attention deficits. And there are programs that, that can do, do that. And I, so I wouldn't just take a note from the district and say that they don't qualify because you, you can push through that. Mm -hmm. Great advice. We see that all the time. We recently started, I want to say, I know off the top of my head within the past month, three students that truly were in that gifted range, mm -hmm. you know, that had done... Um, an assessment, you know, that, that measured IQ, you know, in the 140 range. Um, and most of their testing scores were in that, you know, greater than 99th percentile, but auditory processing, you know, those kinds of skills were 16th. Well, okay, low normal, except for this child, that range is so great. And parents um, really resonated right. with them. When we talked about, no, the gap, we need to pay attention to, you know, if this student performs high in all other skills and this one skill is low normal, that is a huge discrepancy and it is definitely contributing to challenges. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we see it all the time. Absolutely. Um, I want to make sure I get to everybody. I know this is, this is you know, hot topic. Um, Flora asks, what, what next steps should parents follow when their son is giving a, given a high school diploma and an IEE. The IEE indicates he should remain in school until the age of 22. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So like I was saying before, they can just give a high school diploma. There's this good, I forget what case it was. It, was a, it wasn't a special ed case specific. They filed in state court. Uh, so I think it was one of the, the judges, this, the um, superior court judges here in California, but basically said, a high school diploma is no more an education than a birth certificate is a baby. And mm -hmm. it, just because you get a high school diploma doesn't mean you've actually been educated. So if your outside assessments are saying that we have these deficit areas that the school should continue to provide and uh, federally and under the IDA, it's up until age 21. In California, they've extended it to, to 22, uh, but it really depends when your birthday falls. So it's staggered a little bit, but, um, but the idea would be if you get a high school diploma, the district, by proof of that high school diploma, this is the position, they've, they've met their burden and you no longer qualify for services. So, so uh, you know, some families would want to continue say no on the high school diploma. Um, it's a question for the IEP team. It's a question uh, to talk and say, do we want to pull them off diploma track? And just because they met their credits, um, 
And I think, you know, it's easier if you do this as a freshman or a sophomore, but the time that they're a senior, they're going to try to push through. Um, the idea would be almost if they're just not going to agree and they don't want to provide anything else, you would have to file a due process complaint and you would have to. Now, there are times where what we'll do in settlements, we'll get a high school diploma and then we'll have the district fund an extensive program. Um, and when I say extensive, it could be four or 500 hours of a specific remediation program. Uh, it could be something like the Stoll Learning Center where they're going to then say, okay, Instead of suing, you know, instead of going to hearing, we're going to pay to remediate all those deficits that that student care continues to have post high school. And then you're, you're, it's almost like a divorce with the district. You're done, and then they pay for this, this intervention. Uh, if you want them to stay until they're 22, my question would be, are their programs even good? Do you want them to continue? Do you want them to be in the workability program, the adult tra transition program? And just have that conversation with the team and talk about their adult transition program. Can they get the high school diploma but remain in the adult transition program? They, they could. There's nothing in the law that would prevent that. And just have that communication. And when you hit a no, you know, try to find that, that, that common ground that you can build on. And if not, then obviously there's, you would have to reach out to an advocate or attorney for additional support and, and guidance. But um, to answer the question specifically, you can get a high school diploma and stay in the program that the district allows you. Otherwise, talk to the district about your options. Um, just to piggyback, Tanya is saying, you know, she kind of has an opposite situation, whereas she wanted her child to finish high school because he was just failing and they needed to be done, even though socially he wasn't ready to be out of school, um, just because it, it just was not working for, for him. Um, and so that's kind of the flip side too, I, I understand. Um, so another uh, question, this is from Ellie, who is in California, we know. Uh, my son attends a public charter school. It is chartered with a local school district, but operates as its own LEA um, and uses charter SELPA. Services are not provided by the district. As a charter, they say they have limited resources and believe his needs would be better met by the district, which is, has a more restrictive program. They say the district is not open to an MOU. I don't know what that is. Um, and I will need to disenroll from the charter if I accept the offer. Uh, is this legal? So, um, yeah, let me, this isn't legal advice. I don't know the, the, you know, I'd have to really do the whole case analysis, talk to you, get all the details, um, to understand, but based on, on the information and generally speaking, uh, they can offer whatever they want and they could, openly say the district has more resources so you might want to go there but um and with the mou which would be the memorandum of understanding the agreement between the charter and the district um they don't want to enter into an agreement but just generally speaking the charter school is the lea the charter school gets the money from the special education funding and they have you're right they have a lot of the the cell of the charter schools have the which they use the el dorado selpa often the charter schools, uh, they have to provide what your child needs. It, they're a public school. So just take away the charter and just assume they're a public school. They're, they don't have a district, but they're a public school. So they have to provide exactly what your child needs to receive a FAPE, period. What you decide to do, because you know I'm a big fan of, of the charter schools for a lot of our students because they're able to be so flexible and do things that districts are just so commonly say no to. Uh, so I always encourage our families, well, don't like sue the charter school for services that they just really can't pr provide, but you could, and people do, um, try to find and work within a system that's going to provide what your child needs. So the idea would be, do you need to go back to the public school? Are they going to offer what you want? Is, is it, if it's more restrictive and that's a concern, then figure out what the charter school can do and just kind of weigh your options. Um, but to answer your question, the charter schools are just like a public school. They have to provide a faith. Um, and then sometimes you can just get a buyout from the charter school too. I hate to say to say that, but the charter school will just pay you to leave if they can't provide your students your 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 child's needs. Interesting. Um, Ellie is asking, can you share the name of those twice exceptional experts or any resources? Her her child is twice exceptional, a two E kid. We use the term two E. Yeah, for sure. And well, Jill, you guys look at that, right? Like, will you do some assessments and look at like you're saying, Lauren? So you guys, um, and I think our information is going to be listed at the at the end. We we have a great expert that that we often refer to, uh, Dr. Marta Shen. Uh, she's in I believe Newport Beach, but she's in Orange County, 
and we have a podcast. I think our website will be listed. There's a podcast series that that we run that we just interview different experts on a, on this. The video is so nice, but it's a podcast. <laughs> and um, I think Dr. Shin ha has a podcast there. There is also, I think it's out of the University of Iowa. Um, but you can always re reach out to me, and I'll give you this specific information that that does two E assessments, and they'll just do huge file reviews for for you. And then they'll put together good recommendations of how to qualify your, your, your child. And we've been able to use that to get IEPs for students. Great. Just to clarify, we don't do um, an intelligence test. Like we don't do like a comprehensive battery. We're really looking at those underlying skills. Uh, we do do we do know Dr. Martishin from Variation Psychology. I did a webinar with her. Um, we kind of co-hosted that. So I am familiar with her and she does she does a wonderful job. Absolutely. Whoa. And I guess you guys will look at the executive functioning piece. And that's usually the weaknesses with our two E kids, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Okay. We're really looking at the skills, you know, auditory processing, visual processing, you know, reading and, and how it's breaking down as far as academics. So great advice. And if there is information we can post in the chat afterwards, um, just so that you can can get that information, parents. Um, okay. Let's see. Uh, Flora is just following up about her son with that's, you know the team recommended that he continue services to 22. He's almost 20. The IEP established that he did regress, uh, but since he met his credits, they're done. They want to enter into a settlement agreement, which is kind of what you're recommending. So she says, thank you for the information. Um, and Annie is just saying, thank you so much for all this information. She's feeling encouraged and less alone. And that's why we're doing this show. Okay. <laughs> this is why we have peace this is why we have our experts is because yeah, it's hard. It's hard to be a parent. It's really hard to be a parent right now. Um, and especially if your child has learning or attention challenges. So uh, that's what we're here for. Um, let's see. And Tanya is asking, do you know if any schools are starting to offer two e tracks? I just think this would help keep high schoolers from dropping out of high school. It seems like common sense. Have you heard of anything like that? Yeah, I know here in Orange County, we have STEM Cubed, uh, which has a school in, in Los Angeles as, as well. It's more, you know, it's, I, my understanding of it is it's really our high, high functioning autistic students, uh, which just have the, a really good curriculum, but a lot of them are, are 2 e I think there's, you have to look at charter schools, even like just putting a program to, together. You know, we, we have a, a case we're working on with the students in elementary, but uh, is in high school. And we were able to really work with the school district to provide, try some, some you know, like middle school classes last year. And then now he's at, he's at high school as an elementary. And a lot of districts will push back, but they've been really collaborative trying to, so if they need a higher level of class, and that usually takes a lot of their attention problems away, a lot of their behavior goes away if they're being challenged in class. So for some of the 2E kids, it's just looking beyond. And, and the districts can be really good, like, hey, this teacher would be great with them. And the older students are really great usually. And you know they can be in advanced classes at high school, but, but be younger. And then if that doesn't work, reach out to some private schools. And we've, we've had some really good private schools be able to take some of our 2E kids and just provide them to be really flexible, even if it's just a few classes. Um, so there, there, there's a lot that can be done. Again, this kind of goes back to what we were saying. You got to think outside the box, find the solution, bring it to the team and, and try to get them to buy into it. Absolutely. And BB Nas is just uh, recommending Bridges Academy in Los Angeles. Yeah. We, yes. we know of, yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you everyone. Um, I'll check back in one more time. So if you do still have questions or comments, be sure to post them, but we do wanna make sure that we get to all the information that Rich has to share today. So thank you so much, parents. Thanks, Lauren. This is LD Expert Live. My guest today is Rich Isaacs, founder of the Special Needs uh, Law Group in uh, California Special Needs Law Group. And, uh, you do work in California, but not the rest of the country. So if someone was looking for an advocate or an attorney to help them out with services for their child, um, what should they be looking for? Yeah, uh, you know, I think you're going to start with, it's a personality thing. It's going to be a long relationship. You want to find somebody that you trust. You want to find somebody that you just work well. And we know not all personalities mesh. You know, some parents want a more aggressive person. Some parents want a more, you know, collaborative person. So I would interview several and just trust the system. 
you're going to have to trust their guidance and you're going to have to share. And it's almost, you know, like you're going to build this relationship of, of almost like a counselor. They're going to hear your frustrations. They're going to take your frustrations and they're going to articulate it and put a plan together. And that's, that's all we, we do. Um, but it's a long process. Even in the best case scenario, you're, you're, you're looking at working with somebody for several months, if not longer than a year. A lot of our families, we, we just stay on. We're not actively involved, but we're always here. And we'll get back involved with triannual IEPs or getting additional assessments and dealing with, with issues. Um, and then you can, in California, you can, you can Google it. Uh, the Office of Administrative Hearings has a list of advocates and attorneys. Different states would, would as well. COPA, the big or, uh, national organization, has a list of advocates. But I would just encourage you to find somebody that you work with well, that you work with, well with, and interview them. Ask them questions. And the, the couple of just really quick things, they should be able to hear your information and give you a, at least a general strategy and plan moving forward. Um, you want to you want to hear and, and like, OK, so, you, you know, I, I explained everything, but where are we going to go? They should be able to give that to you, at least an idea before you hire them. Um, and then, you know, if you have to make a change, you, you can make make a change. But but try to f initially find somebody that that you can just connect with. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I love the approach that you've kind of talked about throughout. So that approach of being solution oriented, you know, we're looking for solutions for kids and a good relationship with the schools. And so um, just real quickly, can you just kind of run down how that can be accomplished? Yeah, for, for, for sure. So, you know, we, when, when I set up California Special Needs Law Group, it was, you know, we came up with our values, friendly, solution focused. Um, and it's really key. And the district wants to do the same thing. They don't want to butt heads with you. Usually when we get involved, something's broken. So all we have to do is, you know, and again, it takes time, but we have to identify what's broken identify the solution and get the school district on board with that. And it looks different for every child, but that's the process. And it helps that process if you're friendly along the way. And when I say friendly, it doesn't mean we're weak. We push really hard. We file a lot of complaints against school districts because that's what they need uh, to actually be to get to a yes, but it's not personal. And the last thing we want to do is frustrate the process. So some of the things like, oh, if I bring an attorney, it's going to seem aggressive. No, it's not because it's actually going to, or an advocate, because you're actually going to start focusing on developing a solution and the team will appreciate it. We work with a lot of school districts who are just frustrated and the parents are frustrated. And then when we get involved, you know, they'll just, oh, we're so happy that, that you're here because we can start moving this forward. And the same with the district councils. Councils, you know, parents are like, oh, they're gonna bring an attorney. I'm like, well, that's good. That means that they know that your case is of significance and they want to try to resolve it. And the, their district's attorney is gonna hold the district accountable and the district's attorney is gonna be solution focused. It's just, it's developing the team to solve the problem. And it can feel overwhelming. It can, be, it can get very frustrating. It is a big bureaucracy. It's just staying friendly and finding a solution. And then, you know, we always say that we just, we take everything and we package it up and we present it to the school district that they want to jump on board with it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we really hope for. And that's what families should, should, should seek out. And it, that is, that is such a, a refreshing look at it, that it, that it doesn't automatically, if you get attorneys involved, it doesn't automatically mean that it's, oppositional, you know, that it really is, you're trying to find solutions. And um, earlier you kind of mentioned, and I just want to say it again, that, you know, we want to bring solutions and help solutions look outside their toolbox, you know, provide some other ideas that maybe they hadn't thought of. Absolutely. For sure. And they'll, they'll listen. You know, it's, it really is. It's a group of people that care about the students and there's always exceptions, right? But for the most part, the educators got into it because they care. They're frustrated because, you know, uh, multiple IEP beings trying to understand. All, and they're as frustrated with this pandemic as everybody else. Mm -hmm. uh, but they care. And you can build on anybody who cares. And you can build, you know, the relationship together. You may disagree on some stuff. Keep the personal stuff out. Don't take things personal as much as you can. And just focus on the solution. And they will get there. That, that's our experience. Great. 
Uh, I just want to circle back to one thing you said very early in the show um, about requesting help for their child uh, if they aren't already in special education. You know, because of distance learning, parents are getting a firsthand look at their struggles with school and maybe realizing that the challenges are much greater than they thought. You know, we work with so many really bright kids and, and they find ways to gut it out or, you know, push through, get around it. But ultimately, it takes a huge, huge amount of effort. And, and now with kids doing school at home, parents are seeing that and may be kind of shocked at what it's really taking for their kids to manage. And um, so just if a parent is seeing that and they think, gosh, I really think that I need some help and, and they haven't gone down this road before, how do parents go about requesting special help for their child? What do they need to do? Uh, yeah, the, the threshold for the district assessing is really low. And a teacher can refer a child, um, a parent can refer a child. You want to put your, your request in, in writing and they may try to discourage you. They may say, oh, no, no, we'll monitor. Oh, we'll start the, you know, the RTI, the student study team, the SST meeting, and we'll talk about it. That's all great, but that can't delay the process. So once you make the request and document why, what are you seeing and what concerns do you have that you want them to assess? Don't assume just because they assess that they're going to qualify. And that's what districts do. You got to remind them, no, no, no. We're only assessing to determine if they need special education. And once they do that assessment, then you, it's going to help no matter what. I wish every child could get a special education assessment just to see their present levels, their strengths, their weaknesses. And maybe they qualify, maybe they don't, but it's a good thing to know about your child. How are they processing? Like you guys mentioned, the auditory, the visual, how are they processing? We all are different. So I would, I would really encourage those families that have any concern whatsoever, request in writing, uh, rights law. Um, they have some, some good letters and I think sample letters or some good information on rightslaw.com that helps families throughout the country. It's based on federal laws so or not state specific. That's a really good resource. I think we have some resources on our, our website too, but you need to make the written request. It can be in an email. And if they say no, don't, don't let them say no. Just repeat the request and repeat the request. Um, if they do agree to assess, they have to provide an assessment plan within 15 days in California. Once you sign it, they have 60 days to complete that assessment and hold a meeting to review those assessments. Um, there is no time frame in terms if they don't assess, but there's a lot of legal authority out there that really says if it's a reasonable request, they have to, to, to do it. Not to say that they will, but they should. And um, don't be dissuaded though if they say no document why and push them. And then if they do say no, you can't get around them, reach out to an advocate or, or a lawyer to give you a little bit more guidance or a little bit more strength, but you definitely need to get them assessed. Great. Thank you, Rich. Let's, let's quickly check back in with Lauren before we uh, wrap up for today. There, there she I is. Am. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Um, just a lot of parents saying, saying thank you for this. I, I know it's really needed right now. Ellie says, thank you for sharing your time and expertise. Bibi Naj says, thank you. Um, Aslam, thanks to all. Uh, Karen chimes in, yes, thank you. I've been on both sides of the table as a speech and language practitioner and as a parent, you can never learn enough about the process. Um, and we will be putting up um, we will be putting up your contact information, uh, Richard Isaac's um, contact information and his law group so that you can access and contact him. Um, and I just wanna, you know, Annie said, you know, she said, I thank you for sharing and I don't feel as alone as a parent. And and I said, this is why we do this. This is why we have mom squad. So I, if you're not already a member, I encourage you to join. Um, again, it's a Facebook group. You can find us by searching Facebook groups, SLC Mom Squad, and request to join. But that is why we started this and why we started LD Expert Live, um, and as well as our peace group. So next week, our peace meeting on January 21st um, is is for you, for you as parents, so that you don't feel as alone. We will be, you know, discussing the parents' journey. What got you to this point? What is distance learning? 
Um, and what is it like for you? Um, and how can we support you? And what are some resources that we can share? Um, so that is really the purpose of peace when we used to hold them in person. I mean, they were just really widely attended. We've had parents from all over the country ask us for years, can you broadcast this? And we didn't ever want to because we wanted to keep it kind of intimate and, and, and private because you are, you're, you're, you know, experiencing some things as a parent. Um, but now, you know, that we're going to be hosting it virtually and just broadcasting in mom squad, it keeps it kind of intimate like that. So I encourage you to, to join parents. But thank you so much um, for uh, sharing your expertise today. I, our parents are, are definitely very appreciative. So, th and thanks everyone who um, commented and, and shared questions. Great, thanks. thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Um, Rich, do you have any last thoughts for our viewers before we, before we go today? Yeah, I just want, you know, stay positive. There is a good community out here. You know, we we answer a lot of questions for free. So don't feel intimidated if you want to reach out for a point. I wish I could spend my whole day just pointing families in the right direction because there are a lot of, uh, there's a lot of information out there. It's just not in a, in a, in a good or easy accessible place. Jill, you're, you're, you know, this, this presentation expert live, it's fantastic. You're doing that. I think it's really going to help families. So it's encouraging to hear the comments that it does, but you're not alone. And, um, we can find solutions to everything that that's happened. Uh, there's plenty of time. So just don't feel panicked that you have to rush through, through this and, and stay positive and, and healthy. And Jill, thank yeah. you. Oh, thank you, Rich, for joining us today. And and for all of your uh, help and your commitment to helping students and families. Rich and the California Special Needs Law Group are in Irvine, California, but can work with families anywhere in California. They are a tremendous resource for families and students with exceptional needs. This is LD Expert Live, your place for answers and solutions for learning disabilities, dyslexia, and attention challenges. We're live every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Pacific. Next Tuesday, we have a very special show for you. Our guest, Houston Craft, is an inspirational speaker who has spoken at schools all over the country, sharing principles of kindness with students. He has a message that everyone needs right now as he talks about the kind of deep kindness that will change the world. You do not want to miss it next Tuesday, 10 a.m. Pacific. In fact, this might be one that you want to watch with your kids, especially if you have adolescents and teens. Stowell Learning Centers are open for remote sessions and screenings. We are loving getting the opportunity to virtually serve students all over the world. We are also seeing students on site with all of the COVID precautions which we are also loving and so grateful to be able to do. We work with children and adults doing targeted brain training to improve thinking and learning. Our goal is to help students reach their potential and become confident, independent learners. We do that by identifying and developing the weak underlying learning or processing skills that are keeping the student from learning as easily as he or she should be. If you would like a free consultation for yourself or your child, give us a call or visit our website at stowellcenter.com. Thank you again, Rich, for your very valuable guidance. To all of our viewers, there are so many parents out there looking for answers. So if you found this helpful, please share. And don't forget to subscribe on YouTube so that you don't miss any of these amazing guests. We'll see you next week.